Hello, my loves. Welcome to Conscious Conversion, a weekly podcast about how we bridge the gap between business and spirit, money and meaning, technology and regeneration in a wildly changing world. In a time of so much polarity and uncertainty, this podcast explores how together we are connecting across the planet, across our differences and across dimensions as we build the new earth together. I am your host, Sarah Yemtich, and today I am kind of blissed out to have this conversation with Dr. Kat, Dr. Kat Meyer. She's a licensed psychotherapist specializing in sex, trauma, and ketamine-assisted therapy, aka KAP, um, author, yoga teacher, and international speaker dedicated to evolving the relationship we have surrounding sexuality and our bodies. She's the host of podcasts Eat, Play, Sex, and Erotically Wasted, and the founder of SexLoveYoga.com, an online platform for education and programs on relationships, sexuality, and embodiment. I have been perusing your stuff, Dr. Kat, for a while now and just absolutely in love with what you're putting out there. Mm -hmm. That gives me chills. Thank you. My <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's just really lovely. I've been thinking so much about pleasure for a while now, and it's just so lovely when you encounter other people who have that sort of sensibility. And when we derive pleasure from kindness and fun and joy and laughter, and then we just do get into that effervescent space together. So that's why I knew this would be fun. Yeah. Hence the name of my podcast, Eat, Play, Sex. It's like th three of my <laughs> favorite things, eating, playing, and sex. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Totally. So um, I like to start with a bombshell of a question. We were just talking before I hit record about how I like to, these are discussions, not interviews. I do start with some questions just to get the ball rolling and get us sort of, you know, diving in deep. Mm -hmm. But we like to imagine ourselves, and I, and I haven't said this on air before, but I feel like with Dr. Kat, this is the best time to say it on air. I like to imagine ourselves in a bathtub under the stars with a glass of wine in one hand, a spliff in the other. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about God. We're talking about humanity. We're talking about yes. the new paradigm. So just imagine that that's where we are right now. And in that space, I'll ask you my first bombshell question, which is what is your purpose in this moment, in this incarnation on this planet oh, right now? Oh, that's so good. <laughs> well, it is very clearly to help people to evolve the relationship, to change the relationship around their bodies and around their sexualities, to really reclaim that as theirs and to reclaim their birthright, which is pleasure of their bodies and of their sexuality. I'm so passionate about that. And from you know my own personal experiences and all of the clients that I work with, seeing how much trauma and how much uh, pain and distressing events and, and uh, overpowering happens across the world as it relates to these two things. You know, who owns our body? Who owns our sexuality? These questions are in the air. It's in the ethers, even though we think that it's our own selves, but there's powers that are around us that are trying to, to clamp us down, to clamp down our power. So I want to help people to unlock that and really remember that this is their body. This is their sexuality. This is their expression, their unique power, their unique expression that, that they can harness. And, and when we realize that, and when we take the journey to, to reclaim that, we tap into so much infinite power. You know, sexuality is our life force energy. And if we unlock that, we're vibrant, we're alive, we're, we're happy, we're in pleasure, we're, you know, all these, these um, very powerful uh, vibrations. Ah, I love it. And I, I wanted to ask this question too, although you've already started to, to allude to it and go there, but why is pleasure and sensuality and sexuality? I don't know which one you want to answer first. They're Ooh. distinct and the same. Yes. Why are they so powerful? Oh, that's so great. Okay. So let's first, first I want to start out with identifying the difference between sensuality and sexuality, because that's really important. In our culture, a lot of times we'll see these two interchanged 
and especially in the marketing world where, you know, we're trying to get around uh, Facebook ads and, and censorship. And so we're using sensuality and replacement of sexuality, and that's not accurate. And it's actually inhibiting um, people's ability to, to access sensuality. Uh, so sensuality is the platonic relationship with our body. It's the experience of the pleasure of the world through our five senses. That's it. Sexuality is the primal energy as it exists in our body. It's the way that we identify ourselves in the world. And as that relates to our attractions, our orientation, our orgasmic potential, our desire, our um, pleasure with that sexual primal energy. And they can exist together. And that's what makes juiciness uh, around solo sex or partnered sex, you know, where we're dropped into um, the taste of the salt of the skin of our partner, or we smell the perfume on their skin. You know, we're really dropped into the senses and the pleasure of that, uh, the enjoyment of that. When I say pleasure, I mean the enjoyment of these senses. And then they can also exist separately too, you know, where sensuality doesn't have to include sexuality in it. It can, but it doesn't have to. And similarly, sexuality can exist without sensuality. And even sometimes when we're tapping into our sensuality, we might feel a flutter of sexual energy. We might feel the tingles. We might feel the flutters or the, the turn on in our body. You know, that's every time we eat a piece of chocolate that's like, oh, so good. And we moan to it. And that <laughs> helps, that's us connecting with that primal energy. But for so many of us, because we don't have a healthy relationship or we have some of these distressing memories or messages around sex, we might avoid practicing sensuality out of fear of tapping into that primal energy. And that's too bad because the sensuality helps us to develop this relationship with the body and it helps us to drop into the subtle cues of the body. You know, we get to um, experience how the body is perceiving our environment. So that communication between our body and the world around us is called neuroception. It's constantly picking up cues in the environment and labeling it as something that's safe or something that's dangerous. So our bodies are literally contracting and expanding to what it is picking up. And that uh, the more that we can develop this sensuality, then we can develop more of that intelligence of the body and connection with the voice inside. Now, we can also, um, I do think it's also really important to identify that uh, sensuality can be a twofold piece. So sometimes we can't access sensuality until we feel safe, until the body feels relaxed enough and picking up cues in the environment enough to feel the pleasure of, uh, of our bodies. And of course, because pleasure isn't, isn't lower on the, um, uh, on the hierarchy of needs, right? We need to survive. We need to take care of ourselves first before we can tap into the pleasure. Um, but we can also use that to our advantage in the other way of using sensuality to anchor and create that safety in our body too. So there's twofold ways of, of, um, accessing that. So I see pleasure as, you know, uh, the uh, expansion. Uh, pleasure is an opening of the body. You know, we, mm. we pick up, uh, how do I say this? Let me see if I can explain this a little bit more. Um, when we feel safe in the body, we'll start there. Our pleasure receptors open or our sensory receptors open. When we're relaxed, the body opens, it expands, it can pick up more experience in our environment. And so similarly with pleasure, that's such a high vibration and open experience of the body. We can take in more, we feel safe. And so I think that as we're talking about, you know, why is pleasure so important? Why is sensuality so important? Because it does, it's, it requires us to be relaxed, open, so we can receive all of this um, really powerful, juicy enjoyment of the world and of ourselves. I love that. I even had to take some notes. I mean, so what, what I'm hearing 
is that pleasure is a specific tone of sensuality that helps us open up and learn sort of how to hear our own bodies, how to listen with our body. And that in turn helps us to be <clears throat> more primal, which then in turn helps us to be more instinctual, which then also would help us to tap into our intuition better. So then you can have the discernment of knowing what is, um, what's safe and what's not safe even better as opposed to the trauma informed safety. Like you can have real discernment. Right, right. Because when we're picking up these cues in the environment, even, even before our head is able to, you know, create the story or make the understanding around it, your body's having a natural uh, response to it. And that is based, it can be based on what's happened to you in the past. Because what we do know is that, um, uh, the timelines around what's happened into our past, like distressing trauma events in our past, collapses onto the present moment. And so it can feel like uh, the trauma is happening right now. Or we're picking up these cues in the environment that remind us of a past traumatic experience. And so it activates as if it's happening now. And just like you said, Sarah, if we can develop this ability of tuning into the body, and then we're able to look around and recognize, okay, I'm actually safe right now. I'm, there's nothing in my, in my environment that is dangerous. You can then downregulate your nervous system or help your nervous system to calm so that you can return into that more uh, pleasurable state. And, and discernment. I love that you use discernment because I think discernment is one of those skills that uh, I, I, I think we need to cultivate in this culture. I think a lot of us are turning to somebody else telling us what to do or what to believe mm. or how to make sense of the world. And discernment is about that good judgment inside yourself that only you can really identify for you. I love it. And that reminds me of what you were talking a little bit about when I first um, asked you the question of what your purpose is. And you were talking about sort of the, some of these outside influences, right? Mm -hmm. That that have kind of kept us from our power and so much, oh my gosh, I'm so obsessed with this topic about um, us. And it's because I'm on the journey. I'm so deep in the journey. It's like, I want as many people to come with me yeah. as possible. It's good that of we're this in the bathtub journey with, of... with a spliff and a wine. <laughs> yeah, wine. Um, who, who wants in? Um, but this, this journey of awakening to what, wow, how much power we have in our bodies and how much power we have, how much power sex and sensuality has and how we have been so, so, um, I don't like to use victim language, so I'm trying to get away from that, but like how much we are separated from that, mm -hmm. how much we have separated ourselves as a collective and how much it has been imposed on us. How, however you want to look at it, it, it's amazing mm -hmm. to begin to wake up to your own, power and the power of life force energy that's associated with sex right. and the power of pleasure that's yeah. associated with sensuality and presence. Sure. And even, I love that you said, I don't want to use a victim mentality. And so we can even reframe, you know, some of these past historical experiences of, um, you know, of, uh, overpowering and some of the, the, uh, you know, yeah, as, um, these, you know, we all have these individual parts inside of us that are operating in a way to trying to um, take care of ourselves and trying to thinking that they know the best way to yeah, protect us, to take care of ourselves, to manage situations that are going on around us. And so all of these in individual parts have their own percept, uh, what's the word, perceptions around what's going on. So even if we zoom out on the macro level to remember that every human in this world, these inside parts are all operating thinking this is the right solution. This is how we take care of ourselves. This is how we gain the power because we don't feel um, in power or we feel um, afraid or uh, you know, for this, that or the other for centuries. Like this, this I think that can help us to, um, to, find more of a deeper compassion and connection with the human condition when we see it in that way versus the blame and the mm -hmm. shame of 
of this person um, doing this to me or, and I don't want to take anybody's story away either because I do want to honor that that's, that's some people's stories that they, that they do want to, to hold and that's okay too. Yeah. I mean, so it gets really trippy when we start thinking about how, you know, how we are all one and we're all this fractalized individuation of, of the one. And when you do look at it that way, then you're never a victim because you're looking at your perpetrator and saying, I am you and you are me. Mm -hmm. And the more that I can, you know, look at that and feel that and, and forgive and have compassion. And I'm not, again, I want to go back to where you just went, which is like, I don't want to take away anybody's experience and, and whatever perception they have of that. Like you have to go through your own process around that when, especially if you have been um, victimized in some way and at the macro level, we are all one. And this whole world is a reflection of, of ourselves as within, so without, as above, so below. And yeah. And it's, and it's uh, to add to that, because I'm a trauma therapist and I've also experienced yeah. trauma in the past and, and around sex in particular. And it's, uh, I, there are parts inside of us that can feel that can feel violated, can feel mm. fear, can feel anger. And I, and I really want to emphasize that that's okay. You know, the, I don't believe that there's anything in the in the tantric uh, uh, mentality is that there's no part of this human experience that that I'm having that is bad or not okay. You know, and so when these parts do pop up, can I meet those parts inside of myself with compassion, with curiosity, with mm-hmm. presence, instead of shaming that part because it feels violated or shaming this part because it's angry or it's scared or it's anxious. You know, this morning I, I woke up with uh, one of my parts that was feeling anxiety. And so I really had to take a pause out of my morning and just sit with it and tune into, okay, what is it that you're experiencing? You know, what, tell me about what you're picking up in this environment or about your day or about what the situation is. And it's not going into it with an agenda of getting rid of it. It's about going into it with, just like we talk about secure relationships with other people, can I create that secure relationship with the parts of myself? You know, let me hold you, let me comfort you, let me hear you, let me be with you. And and you can have that experience. And I'm gonna drive the car, me, cat versus let this part drive the car, which we all know what happens when the part drives the car. (laughs) It might, you know, throw something across the room or it might um, put up a wall and block everybody out or it might, um, I don't know, uh, throw a brick through somebody's window. (laughs) But we, so it's, it's, you know, it's identifying the parts, letting them be there and not letting them drive the car. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love that. I, I remember it's um, internal family systems taught me that like exactly a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. It's what you're, it's what you're referring to. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I don't always remember to think of things that way, but I absolutely love, love, love this perspective. And it's so, it's very helpful and to find ways to express those emotions and to allow those parts of us to express them so that they can move through us. Sure. And And sometimes for me, it means putting on a song or putting on a movie or something to like help me, you know, feel it it and really get it out. Yeah. 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 And I, and I think this is important for us to have this conversation too, because Sarah, you're an expert in what you do too. And, and having done this work for so long, and it's important to normalize the human experience of, you know, even when we've done this work for so long, we still have human parts that feel and have, you know, have, um, experiences or perceptions that aren't this, you know, quote unquote, higher self, or isn't quote unquote, you know, what we think it's supposed to be, but it's, it's still just as beautiful and still part of the human experience uh, that if we can tap into the romantic aspect of it, the beautiful aspect of the pain, the anger, the sadness, that that is uh, just as important. Mm. 
I love that. There's a part of me. So I, I mean, just getting really personal about my own stuff. I've got, I'm a, a, you know, a single mom and I run a business as the CEO and it's, you know, I'm, I'm the one. And so the responsibilities are all on my shoulders and there are times where I just feel so sort of lonely with it all, you know? And for the most part, I'm fucking in love with my life. Like I love it. I love my freedom. I love my sovereignty. I, I love all of it. And then there are moments where it's just like, oh my God, it's too much. And I've started, it's taken me a long time, but I've started to like awaken that, uh, that part of me that, that takes care of things, that, that nurtures me, yeah. that like holds me and, and holds me through that, like that moments of shame of like, oh, why am I, why am I longing for, for somebody or, you know, um, and just having that other voice, whether it's the voice of God, whether it's my higher self, whether it's my twin flame, whatever you want to think of it, mm. whether it's. You know, just, um, yeah, my own soul talking to myself. Yes. Um, it helps a lot when I can just like literally hold myself and say, everything's okay. I've got you. Mm -hmm. I do the same thing. I'll curl up on the floor and just imagine holding my younger self who she was, you know, she, she did have moments of feeling lonely or afraid or worried that she wasn't going to be able to take care of herself, you know, and holding mm -hmm. her and and crying mm. and listening to music and and just being present and letting her have her feelings and and that it's okay i'm here with her so i love how you've used you know these these um um archetypes or aspects of yourself to to create that secure relationship with your parts too it's so beautiful love that amazing I just, I love you. I really do. I'm really <laughs> excited that, that I, that we found, <laughs> that I found you, that Valentina actually found you. I love you. Um, yeah, I want to dive into some of the, some of the work that you do. Um, I, I've listened a bit to the Erotically Wasted podcast and I just love it. I feel like I've been longing for something like that mm. my whole adolescent and adult life. You know, I feel like you're just like, so it's so good. It's, and it's um, so accessible. Um, and I love your posts on Instagram too, where you're, um, really just, there's a way in which you, you don't give a fuck with so much compassion and softness. Mm. Um, thank you. But I just, I really, I love, yeah. I uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, and it's for those who don't know, Erotically Wasted is a podcast that I created with erotic stories and um, set to music. So it's a very vibey experience. And I designed it as uh, initially as a uh, practice for tapping into my own erotic energy and um, turning my own self on with writing stories. And then I, I, put them to recording and I put them to music and I was like, Oh, I'm going to share this with people and let that be an inspiration for them to write their own stories and to tap into their own eroticism and desire. If they don't feel like they're um, wordsmiths yet, you know? And, and so um, with that podcast and with my um, Instagram, I'm yes, I, I'm edgy <laughs> and it's scary right now because uh, sometimes I'll put things out there and I'll have a vulnerability hangover. Like, oh my God, I literally just talked about anal sex and I don't know how that's going to be received. <laughs> or I'm talking about, you know, BDSM play and, and some of that is super taboo. And some of that, you know, people, uh, do misinterpret it and take it as literal or take it as, you know, something that, um, just because the misrepresentation and the miseducation in our culture, um, has, has shown BDSM to be something that's pathological. And so I, I know that I'm coming into the mainstream and presenting these very edgy things and due to the cultural wounding and, and um, trauma around sex and misrepresentation, like it's going to be taken in the wrong way sometimes. And so I've learned to really be with that and understand that we're all at the beginning, we're all the product of of this culture that uh, that inhibits our sexuality, you know, that that says sex has to look a certain way or, you know, that this type of sex is wrong. Um, and if somebody has this reaction or trigger, they just don't have the information and they're still they might be operating from from the socially constructed idea of what sex is. And so I, from that lens, we can approach it with gentleness. 
with compassion and curiosity yeah. instead of saying you're wrong or um, too bad you're getting triggered. Like, no, it's okay. I understand where they're coming from. And, and if they want to yeah. hear some information, they can educate themselves or they don't have to. And that's okay too. Um, so it has been a process of, of leaning in and holding, you know, even my nervous system sometimes getting activated of like, oh, okay, we're going to hold this. We're going to calm. We're going to move with, with more grace and curiosity. Uh, but then also sometimes I get uh, Instagram and social media cut me out or, or um, censorship and deletes posts or I've lost my accounts number of times <laughs> because of what I'm talking about. And so it's been an interesting dance of the censorship that's that's coming on more and more around sex, which is just, I see it as the reflection again of what the culture is going through, the fear and the culture around our sexuality and our empowerment, you know, the the, the cultural trauma that's that's been laced through for so long. And uh, I don't see that as, you know, again, necessarily something bad. I see this as a rite of passage for the work that I do as, as, um, as somebody like you ushering in this, this new paradigm, this new way of thinking and freeing ourselves. And it, this is just part of the, the balance of the work. You know, we just, we're going to hit up against these challenges and, and, are we going to let that shut us down? Or are we going to move through it? Like we're asking everybody else to do. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, I was so, I had these other like ideas of questions I was going to ask you. And then I got so involved in what you were saying that I lost them. But, um, I just, it, it takes me down so many paths though, because one thing that has come up for me in the last couple of years, um, has been a, a remembrance and also a deep study and yearning for more information around like ancient priestesshood, mm -hmm. right. And, Tantra and Mary Magdalene. And so there's so much rich, rich, rich um, history that has been blotted out by the same, possibly by the same powers, however you want to look at them, that continue mm. to blot it out now um, as it awakens within us on an individual level. Um, and I think it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to talk about these things. And it's, and it's, I mean, it's not just talking about sex. It's talking about our vital life force energy that creates, it creates yeah. life. It creates poetry. It creates maybe everything. Yeah. You yes. know? Yeah. And there is this, <laughs> for sure. And they're in, and that's the piece where we have to remember that there in everything, there is a balance. You know, there is the light and the dark. There is these opposing forces that work to keep the, the um, I don't know, the word natural order of things, you know, the, that, uh, that just is a part of the human life here on this earth. And so that's why we have people like you and I who are doing this type of work to keep it expanding and not... Uh, to balance out the heaviness of the dark that's that's pushing in on our power. Yeah. One of your um, posts recently was about, and this, this is marrying a couple of my favorite topics, and that mm -hmm. is the sensuality and sexuality piece, distinct yet related. And then you also recently posted about plant medicine. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. The blue lotus. Oh, um, yeah, it's, I mean, can you tell us about it? Just because I think a lot of my listeners are also into plant medicine. If I've sure. if I've done my job here, <laughs> um, yeah. Sure. So, so plant medicine. Um, you know, that is a term that's been become a buzzword term. We're hearing it a lot, and so I think it's important to uh, to uh, identify what that means. And plant medicine in general is an umbrella term for the use of, of plants and flowers and herbs, plant matter in a medicinal way. So how can we use it to amplify, to heal, to um, discover, to expand? And so plant medicine, while it can be something that's psychedelic, like um, 
ayahuasca or psilocybin, it can also be flowers in our garden. So Egyptian blue lotus mm. is a flower that is, uh, has been used in, since ancient Egypt. And so the Egyptians saw this flower as a representation of the rising and setting of the sun. And with that, it was used a lot in, uh, uh, in uh, death rituals. They would lay the flowers over the, over the tombs. Um, they would also use the teas or um, soaking the blue lotus in wine as uh, a part of their sex and orgy ritual. So um, uh, it, it's supposed to create more of a uh, psychedelic experience. If you soak blue lotus flower in wine for about a week or two. And in my experience of it, it's not psychedelic as in psilocybin. It's more of like a psychedelic as a, as a very deeply relaxing, heavy, um, altered state of conscious experience. So not, not the swirls and lights and twirlies, but it is very much like, Ooh, this world feels thick, like, like honey, like grounding, sensual. Yeah. More sensual, more present, very dropped in. Uh, so I love that tea. I love making it as a tea. I love making it as tinctures. I love making it as um, soaking it in wine. It's a beautiful, beautiful tool to use. I mean, that sounds like heaven. That's going to be added now to my bathtub, my <laughs> um, bathtub with um, wine and a spliff and conversations about God and sex and love yeah, well, we is we're going to add it. blue lotus flowers. You can smoke it. Okay. So yeah, we're going to add, we're going to smoke, we're going to smoke blue Lotus spliffs. Yes. I'm into that. <laughs> 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 one, one in our oh, wine, one in our spliff. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> perfect. Exactly. Oh my God. We'll have wine where we have preloaded it with um, yeah. blue Lotus flowers the, the week before. Um, can you talk more about what you do, what your offerings are? You know, I know that you've got like a freebie on your website. You know, this gets in more into my world of like the mm. digital marketing um, for thought leaders of the new paradigm. And, and I feel like you certainly are, are one of those. And thank you for everything that you do. And I want to hear more about what you offer and how people can get involved with what you offer. Yeah, so they've heard a little bit about how I work throughout this, this whole experience. I, um, I I do have an offering for everybody. It's a, a Sensual Sundays guide, and it has rituals and products all around sensuality to help you to create a ritual of practicing your sensuality. And for me and for many, many women, femme, non-binary, even men, uh, sensuality hasn't been a high priority for us. And again, we live in a very fast paced, productive oriented, um, highly stim stimulating environment. And so to take the time to slow down and to be with our pleasure and to be with our senses and, and our body essentially, um, can can be hard, you know, to, to create that space and break into it. So I had created years ago how um, uh, I, I deemed Sundays my sensual day, so, sensual Sundays. And so on Sundays was my, I'm going to go slower. I'm going to do my yoga. I'm going to do my sensual bath time, or I'm going to, you know, do some of these practices and just really be with my body. And so I turned that into a... Uh, a, an experience for everybody else through this guide. And then every once, one Sunday out of each month, I do a, a sensual Sunday where we get together online and, and we do some sort of sensual practice like plant medicine or, or um, uh, you know, embodiment practices. Um, then I do online uh, programs around sensuality. I have a sensual awakening, which is a 14 day initiation. And that's like the basics of sensuality. And then for those who want to take this more erotically and more sexually, um, I have an erotically undone six week course that I do live. And that is a bringing in sensuality, but also sexuality and passion and sedu seducing and learning about the intelligence of your body to amplify all of those. And so that's my online offering. And then I also have online or uh, in-person retreats. 
And those are for couples and those are for women um, and femme who want to explore their sexuality and their eroticism. That's a really powerful and juicy. And, and um, again, I'm trauma informed. So I take everybody through a sequence that builds upon each other, um, you know, creating the safety, like we talked about at the beginning of the session of, of um, how important it is to, to, to connect with safety so that you can access sensuality and sexuality and then lead them through practices that even when they do get triggered, because that happens just by the nature of, of being a sexual being in this world and all the trauma that we experience, how can you uh, self-regulate and create that safety once again so that you can progress in your relationship around your sex and your sensuality. And then for those who want to work with me individually, I do um, uh, ketamine assisted therapy. And so I work with couples and individuals <clears throat> around their sexuality or around their relationships using the um, incredible properties that ketamine provides um, to be able to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, redefine pleasure, connect with sexual energy in their bodies, um, connect with their partner in a way that that is uh, more accessible and more uh, empathy uh, driven and um, and then be able to connect with their own bodies and their own emotions and feeling without uh, in more of a spacious way without uh, dysregulating their body. So ketamine is really powerful for for it, it's it's known as being a dis dissociator, but you don't actually disconnect from your body. You're actually with your body, um, at least at low doses of ketamine. And it gives us a way to be able to just kind of create some space so that you can see the emotions, you can see the feeling, you can see and feel the energy as it moves through your body, but it's not overwhelming for you. And so I have mad respect for that medicine in the clinical setting and it's used for sex and relationships. And when are you coming to Costa Rica next? <laughs> <laughs> All of this. I'm like, oh yes, this in-person retreat sounds good. Oh yeah, it's a little ketamine. <laughs> sounds um, I mean, I'm kidding and I'm serious. So yeah. Um, when, it, when is, what is your next um, live offering for one? Cause I think you've got one coming up soon. Yes. Yes. So April 18th is my opening of my online course for eroticism. So it's called Erotically Undone. And this is the six week course progresses you from you know, developing the relationship with your body, the intelligence of your body, self-regulation, all the way through the best sex with yourself, the best sex with other people. Um, I'm inviting uh, guest experts to teach around uh, kinky power play to strip tease to energetic love making. So, so it's a whole, um, it's a very comprehensive, uh, program that touches on all the things that support your eroticism as well. And sex. And where can people find, I'm sure they can find out more about that on Instagram over the coming days, but yes. when, um, is there anywhere else that, that you suggest people go to find out more about that program and about you? Yes, so they can go to sexloveyoga.com, um, where I host all of these, all of these offerings, all of these pieces. Um, they can also follow me on Instagram at sexloveyoga. Awesome. And seriously, when are you coming to Costa Rica? <laughs> well, let's <laughs> chat, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I absolutely, like, if it wasn't clear, I really, really enjoy talking with you. I, I adore your work in the world and what you're doing. I'm excited to share this with people um, so that they can get to know you as well. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just really grateful for your, for your work. Thanks y'all. Yeah. And, and be sure and, and check out Dr. Kat Meyer, Sex Love Yoga on Instagram. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much.